My topic is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It is a multilateral development bank that is politically and economically backed by the Chinese government and it was founded in 2016. It's been um, kind of a big deal because it's um, uh, being framed as a rival to the World Bank and a lot of um, other um, very dominant multilateral development banks. So. Um, I, what I'm trying to do with this project is to understand how the AIB and its founders, um, its senior management, shareholders, whatever, um, are kind of negotiating this space between trying to be an innovative bank and, and something new, but also um, kind of stay within the status quo. And also then examining the the gaps kind of between the rhetoric that they have and then how that is getting implemented in terms of actual projects. So um, this is the first time I presented this work, so hopefully it, um, you, I, I would appreciate all your comments about what's working and what isn't working, basically. Okay, so um, just in terms of thinking about the rhetoric, this is um, coming from the bank president there's, um, he's talking about it being a historic precedent with um, the old institutions are not keeping up with the needs of a fast growing Asia and um, there's been <laughs> unequal growth among nations and they need to um, mobilize and um, the welcome the idea of a new MDB that would develop a new way of doing things and would actively participate in the shaping of Asia. So we have strong language about it being um, something new and doing things different. But at the same time, uh, President Xi Jinping has um, said things that um, make it seem like the bank will be more status quo, right? So um, they're going to learn from the experience of other multilateral development banks and specifically in terms of their governance structures, environmental and social benefit policies. Um, those are two issues that I'll look at um, a lot in this. So, um, that, so how will the AIB actually differ from its peers in practice though? That's um, what we're looking at. and in terms of the rhetoric, how it's trying to um, me melt the two of the, you know, being um, a historic precedent and also status quo together, I think is through the core principle of it being lean, clean, and green. So this is something that gets said at basically every meeting by the, the president. And um, I am going to argue that um, these three these three words and what they signify are trying to um, play to both the developing countries that are um, borrowing and, and shareholders in the bank and also the donor countries that are also involved in the bank. And so the lean, clean, and green is the manifestation or the, the symbol anyway of those, um, of these, ways of being coming together. Um, so lean is about being efficient, cost effective, and not being tied down with bureaucracy. Clean is about not being corrupt. Green is about um, promoting green, the green economy, investing in renewables, and um, having efficient energy distribution. Um, so I'm in terms of my research questions, just again, it's about the the rhetoric, trying to understand what the how the bank is negotiating between, uh, particularly being lean and, and green, between being um, developing country or borrower friendly, and um, and also status quo, and um, and then how is that being? How are those efforts manifesting in its lending prep? lending practices, I'll be looking and talking about a specific case, um, specific investment that the bank made um, in 2017 in order, to, um, in, in order to investigate and analyze that. So um, just very quickly, I've been doing, it, this research is mostly ethnography and discourse analysis. I've been going to the AIB annual meeting since um, it, the 
bank it was established in 2016, and also some um, public consultations that it has held with uh, mostly non-governmental organizations around Asia. And um, I'm also using a lot of the project documents, uh, some the project documents from this particular project, plus some of the policies that the bank has developed, including the drafts <coughs> that people have made comments on and um, the public statements that they've made. So before I get into that, this just briefly for, I don't, I don't know if everybody is that familiar with multilateral development banks, but um, you know the most well-known one is probably the, the World Bank, started in um, the 1940s after um, World War II in order to reconstruct Europe. And the idea here around multilateralism is, you know, all the um, many governments from around the world are shareholders, and it's in so the idea behind it was supposed to be to promote and peace and coordination and um, economic growth, right? But um, there's these are some of the other banks that have come up over time. Um, but also there's been a lot of controversy about these. I'm not going to go into all of the critiques of multilateral development banks right now, but um, you know, policy conditionality, um, structural adjustment policies in the 90s obviously were very important. And um, what we're seeing now is that the um, proliferation of of alternative financiers is really changing the landscape for multilateral development banks. So that includes sovereign financiers like Zhang Hong was talking about with the China Exim Bank, but also then the AIIB. And um, so um, in, there's not a huge literature on the AIIB yet, obviously because it's only been around for like three years, but um, the uh, literature that is out there, some of it talks about the AIB as being a countervailing institution to the ADB, um, the Asian Development Bank. And so that is, um, by countervailing, they mean it's, it's, in, it's in competition with it and it comes from a place of being dissatisfied um, with the particularly developing countries and particularly China being dissatisfied with the voice that it's had in decision making in these institutions, and then also countries being dissatisfied with the type of projects that are being financed. So, for example, Sri Lanka was a major voice in wanting some alternative to the Asian Development Bank because it wasn't financing um, inf physical infrastructure projects. My research, I just want to point out that um, I that there's been some research that has started to look at the AIB, but um, it's mostly been looking at it from a geopolitical perspective. What are its motivations? Um, what were the motivations for setting it up? Or um, looking at the high-level policies and comparing those to other um, multilateral development banks. Um, there's one other study I found that tries to look at the what's happening at the project level, but only in terms of the policy frameworks for that, for that project. And so what I'm trying to do in this paper is actually look how the, the policies and, and the rhetoric were um, actually implemented in this project and what the outcomes were. Um, not so. I, the analytical framework I'm using is kind of looking at the competition between MDBs and particularly looking, separating them in terms of um, which MDBs are 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 dominated by donor countries and which countries by borrower um, by borrowers. So by donor countries, that's typically the um, OECD. Um, development, um, it, de uh, why can't I remember this? Uh, development assistance, assistance committee, sorry. Um, so uh, that includes um, you know, countries like Germany that are shareholders in the bank, but, um, but typically donor-led MDBs um, are like the World Bank and have the involvement of the US um, or in the ADB Japan is a big one. And borrower-led institutions uh, are less well known, but the Andean um, 
Development Corporation is an example of that, and so it's mostly controlled by the countries who borrow from the bank. I'm not going to go into all the, these three, but these are the some of the ways that research that scholars have shown that there's a marked difference between the banks that are donor-led and the ones that are borrower-led. And what I'm going to be looking at is um, the uh, way that the loan approval process is is different in these types of banks and use that to benchmark the AIB. So I just should go very quickly through this. Um, Donor-led banks, um, they, they, in terms of board oversight and um, environmental and social management systems, that's what that's the two things I'm going to be talking about today. And for board oversight, um, the norm for donor-led multilateral development banks is to have resident boards, which means uh, the board is on salary and on location, and they make all the decisions about project approval. And it um, usually takes them like a, tw a year to 16 months to approve a project. Whereas in borrower-led multilateral development banks, their boards tend to be non-resident. Um, they meet a few times a year to make decisions about projects. Sometimes they make decisions over email. And the time frames for their um, approval process can be much shorter, like as, as few, uh, as short as a month and a half, usually three to six months. And then in terms of um, the environmental and social management systems, how these bank, these types of banks differ. Oh, something's missing, sorry. <laughs> um, so the donor-led multilateral development banks um, tend to want to use the bank's own systems for assessing um, environmental and social risks and coming up with management plans about how to deal with or mitigate the risks that do come up. And um, those are considered to go often above and beyond what national law would say. Whereas in borrower-led MDBs, um, they tend to want to use what's called like borrower systems or client systems. And so that relies on um, if a government is borrowing, then it relies on that government's own system. And it's more about like oftentimes doing the minimum of, um, of in terms of risk assessment. And part of the reason for that is because the um, borrower-led institutions and borrowers in general make the case that um, the other banks, using bank systems are expensive, complicated, and highly bureaucratic. So in terms of what the AIB decided to do um, when it set up its governance structure, um, it went for a non-resident board and also to um, use environmental and social, uh, use borrower systems for the environmental and social framework. But at the same time, it has a pretty broad reaching environmental and social framework, which is um, uh, s like the policies and the mechanisms within the bank that are supposed to deal with um, environmental and social risks. And these, this framework largely conforms to norms set by donor-driven MDBs. And in particular, the ESF, as it's called, is, was drafted by a man who's a four-decade veteran of the World Bank and also drafted the, um, he, he's drafted these policies for at least three multilateral development banks. So really trying to, like, you can see through this how the bank is being both um, new and kind of playing to borrower interests while also trying to um, have a certain amount of conservatism in it. So moving on to my case. Um, so the, the project is, was um, in Beijing, and it's the Beijing Air Quality Improvement and Coal Replacement Project, which I'm just going to call the Beijing Project. Um, it was for two, a $250 million non-sovereign-backed loan that 
the um, bank made to the Beijing Gas Company in late 2017, and it was um, for constructing a network of gas, uh, natural gas distribution lines in order to replace um, coal as a source of heating in rural uh, villages outside of Beijing. And it was part of a larger um, government effort to replace, um, replace coal with natural gas. So the AIB was funding one part of it, but the, the project was more was broader than that. And so some of the financing came from the company and um, also the Beijing municipal government. The reason why I'm interested in this project and chose it out of the 39 projects that the bank has funded so far to look at for this was um, because for two reasons. One, it's a standalone project, which um, means that the AIB is the only multilateral development bank involved. And two, because it's um, the only project finance that, that the bank is financing in China. So why is co um, standalone important? Because so many of the projects that the bank has done so far are co-financed with other MDBs. Um, but And when they do that, they, the bank has tended to use the other MDBs systems for um, environmental and social, for loan approval processes and environmental and social safeguards. So you can't really benchmark what the, what the um, AIB's own systems are like by looking at those projects, I don't think. And then um, I thought it was interesting to have this, to look at a case where the bank was financing a project in China because it showed that the, in this case, China is both the, um, biggest donor and also the borrower. So it's, it's on both sides of the, of the divide. And um, I'm curious to see whose interest um, it will align most with. OK, so, so I'm arguing that it's a model project for th three reasons. One, it's, um, it can fulfill um, the sustainable development, uh, uh, the bank's promise to finance sustainable infrastructure, also to, that it's a test to use the non-resident board and also a test for the borrower system uh, for environmental and social management. And so um, for sustainable infrastructure, this is something where it's saying like, we're, uh, um, we're not competing with other multilateral development banks. We're adding value and we're joining with them in order to fulfill the obligations that MDBs have to implement the um, Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And so this project is, in, uh, the Beijing project is one to um, reduce air pollution and fits into that very well. In terms of the non-resident board, I think it provides an opportunity for the AIB to prove to its non-borrower shareholders that the loan approval process um, with a resident board could provide adequate oversight. Um, and with the borrower system, it can prove that um, you can use the borrower system and still have um, a, still do more than the minimum. And that is because the the project was in turn the banks tend to they put these uh, they they categorize the risk um, into there's three or there's three main categories for um, the level of risk and A B C A is the um, riskiest of projects C is it means it's not very risky at all. And they have different requirements for how um, they, for the types of risk as assessments they have to do. So this project was categorized as a B, which is solidly in the middle, right? Um, which meant that it had to do an environmental and social impact assessment and s have management plans set up. But it wasn't, um, w which is more than it would have if it was a category C, which is basically like you don't have to do those, but you just have to um, make a review of the of in the environmental and social conditions. So um, one of the bank staff said that they 
categorized it as B out of a sense of conservatism that actually it could have been a category C, but they were trying, I, I'm interpreting that to mean that they're trying to um, give a nod to the donor um, shareholders who are concerned about um, stringent environmental and social oversight. Okay, so what actually happened with the project? It ended up being kind of a mess um, in that the um, government required all of the villages and households to stop using coal by October 2017, but not all of the gas lines were in place yet, and so people were freezing during the winter. And it um, got a lot of coverage in the media, both local and um, international. And I think because of that, um, a Chinese NGO decided to use it as a test case for some of the bank's um, environmental and social um, mechanisms, including the information um, requests and information disclosure mechanism and also the complaints handling mechanism. And so basically through that process, they, looking at the project documents, the, it was very short, like three pages. There was no map of where it was going to be and um, no information about the location of the villages or the consultations that they were supposed to hold with it. And then also in terms of the grievance mechanism, they said that the client said they had one, but there was no information about how to access that, which um, it goes against what the AIB's ESF says. And then the bank didn't do a good job of, um, of responding to the information requests that the NGO did either. And this is the letter <laughs> that they wrote back, which didn't actually answer any of the questions that the NGO had. Okay, so they have some inadequate <laughs> systems there, it seems like. And I saw this as um, highlighting some tensions between the efficiency and oversight within the bank. Um, so it, especially the, um, the tensions between efficiency and cost effectiveness on one hand and conforming to the norms of donor-driven MDBs on the other. Um, I'll just quickly say that the, in terms of the board, it highlighted that they were, uh, the board was largely a rubber stamp in this case. Um, inter uh, some interviews with um, people who were familiar with this case showed that the board said that they didn't know any, they didn't have any more information about where these villages were and they questioned if some people questioned if it, even if the villages, um, if that number 510 came out of nowhere and was just um, kind of arbitrarily chosen to meet a government target of some sort, and they largely saw it as um, a political project, and um, so this I think. Um, raises the question of, well, is it just that the board is being a rubber stamp in this case because the project is in China and um, it, you know, it's the biggest shareholder and the bank management wanted it in this case, or um, is it more of a structural issue related to it being a non-resident board? So that's a question. Um, and then second, it wrote it. Um, raises some questions about the tensions in how the staff is handling environmental and social management. Why when it, they, they could have made it a category C project, but they decided to make it a category B, but then not actually abide by the same things. Why, why did they do that? And finally, um, in terms of accountability, the bank is saying um, they're being apologetic. They're saying um, we are, we're trying to learn and do better. But at the same time, um, the investment wing of the bank is, uh, was quote, one person was quoted as saying that the, his job was to shovel money out the door. So, so they're really trying to move forward with the investment projects, but um, not not moving as quickly on the safeguards, and so some of the rhetoric is misaligned there. And I'm going to stop there. I'm so sorry. <laughs>